The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 6, beginning at the 35th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the father who sent me and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that, no, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Thank you, Rhonda. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words that come from my mouth make sense because they are inspired by your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't mind admitting that in preparing to... um, I preached today, I got a little bit stuck. Not because I couldn't think of anything to say, rather that there was too much that I could say about this particular gospel reading. That if I had to unpack it, you'd be here all day and there'd still be more that we could explore. I was getting stuck in my head, starting to think, well, if I go this way, then I'm going to end up down this rabbit hole. And if I mention this, then I'm going to have to mention that. So before I went internally berserk, I decided to start with the obvious, golf. (laughs) Particularly, Olympic golf. And specifically, Olympic golf fashion. Now, I realise that I'm probably the only one here this morning or online who's actually interested in this topic but I'm asking you to trust me and that this superficial beginning might actually lead us somewhere quite deep and profound. On Friday night, we were in the lounge room watching the Olympic golf, or more to the point, everyone else was talking and I was trying to watch the Olympic golf. I made a comment that it was really weird seeing these golfers in their national uniforms because so much of their identity and their income comes from their clothing endorsements. Um, A localish Bow Desert golfer, um, Jason Day, is a great example of this. He's been spoken about a lot this year in golf media, which I'm sure you're all across as much as I am, particularly around his fashion sense. Uh, This year, Jason ended a long-term arrangement with Nike, Classic sports wear brand. You can see him on the screen looking sort of crisp and sharp. And he's now taken up a new deal with Malbon, which you know, I can see by some of the chuckles that you don't quite uh, think that this is cutting edge fashion. Um, but it's trying to target a younger demographic of golfer with a fusion of streetwear and golf attire and a bit of a throwback of fashions to the yesteryear. The criticism is that he's a bit too old to pull it off. But as somebody who likes to wear a cardigan, I'm not going to criticise. 
So to see him at the Olympics in the Australian uniform, I found jarringly different. and Almost like he looked like a different person. There's a few sports being played at the Olympic Games, um, like golf and basketball, that are played by multi-millionaires who've made their fortunes in part by wearing particular brands. So much so that the brands and the athlete become intertwined. Yet there's something about the symbol of playing for your country's flag that seems to see them, for the most part, lay down their identity and take up a new purpose. A nation's flag is a powerful symbol and we're seeing lots of examples of athletes of all different sports becoming different when they represent their country. <coughs> Symbols represent something else, often something that's intangible. And they're like a bridge to make it easier for us to comprehend an idea or a reality that can actually be hard to grasp. The Bible is full of symbolism. Jesus' teaching is full of symbols. And John's Gospel particularly focus, focuses heavily on the symbolism that Jesus uses in his teaching. And so today we're going to explore some of the big ticket items when it comes to symbolism and John's Gospel. Symbolism that helps us to understand who Jesus is and what is eternal life. Last week, uh, if you were here, we unlocked the code that is in verse 35. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's actually saying, God, the bread of life. But as it's coming out of his mouth, he's actually saying, I am Jesus, the bread of life, which was really controversial to the crowd. And in today's passage, he starts to flesh out what that means, but also what it doesn't mean. It is symbolic and metaphoric language, absolutely. But we also need to keep in mind that it comes a day after he literally fed a massive crowd with bread. And the next day, they want more of the same. But Jesus' sign was a symbol, creating a bridge to something that was deeper and more profound. We live in a world where there is a general overabundance of food for most and food insecurity for a minority. And so we tend more readily to accept the symbolic and metaphoric meaning of what Jesus is saying. But I think it's actually good to wonder how these words might resonate in a country or a context where people are actually unsure of where their next meal is coming from. If you have a look at some of the photos out in our foyer, you'll actually see some pictures of what that might feel like in our own country. But it doesn't take much to realise when you look at the rate of the growth of the church in a developing country as opposed to the Western world, that it actually seems like that those in a developing world get the power of the symbolism more than we might. When I was uh, in theological college, we moved there um, as a young family, um, uh, we first moved there when Annika was three turning four and it's about, I don't know, 19 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, it was getting to dinner time and Leanne had come home for, from work and she'd said that she was starving. And um, Annika immediately asked, what's starving, mummy? And Leanne responded, starving is when you're really, really hungry. A matter of fact, four-year-old responded, no, it's not. It's when you haven't had any food for days and days and days. It turns out that one of Annika's daycare teachers had recently returned from a trip to Africa and had been sharing stories with the children. 
It became a thing in our family for a while that whenever somebody used the word starving, Annika would correct them. In our worldview, very few of us experience or actually would have any contact with anyone who's actually literally starving for food. But I think we're living in a world where many of us Many out there, outside the church, are starving for deep care. Bread might not be the staple that it was in Jesus' time. Many of us are trying to avoid carbs. Some of us have got gluten allergies or intolerances. And we live in a world with lots of bread alternatives. And so the symbol of bread has the ability to lose some of its impact. But if you're living in a first century Middle Eastern context, you know that bread is more than just an option or extra. Bread was a staple meant to be taken and eaten every single day. Bread was the foundation of a diet. Bread before anything else. So by comparing himself to bread, Jesus makes himself as necessary to us as the food we eat. In the same way it was bread before everything else, for us it should be Jesus before anything else. I wonder in a developing world whether Jesus just seems more necessary than Jesus does in our context. When we consider the idea of deep care as we have been over the last few weeks, I think it would be reasonable to say that the deepest care that we could offer someone is an introduction to Jesus, that they might have eternal life. But the big question is, what is eternal life? How do I know that I've got it? And how do I get my friends and loved ones to get it? Or at the very least realise it's something that they might be interested in knowing more about. Some zealous believers would believe that it's their life's mission to win as many people as they possibly can for Christ. And that often comes with a message that goes something like, if you died today, do you know where you would go? And there's nothing wrong with this question in and of itself. It's, it's a question that has actually brought many to Christ. But it's becoming more and more problematic in the world that we live in because most people in our culture are pretty comfortable, thank you very much. And so if you said, if you're going to die today, where would you go? Many of them are answering, well, if I died today and there was nothing more, then oh well. That'll do. I've had a pretty good run. Eternity and eternal life is absolutely a future promise. And we see that in today's reading. But as much as it is a future promise, it's also a present reality. It's not whoever believes will have at some point in the future or whoever believes will have on the last day, whenever that might be. It's whoever believes has eternal life. Now, believe and you've got it. Now. Almost seems so simple, doesn't it? Jesus is even more specific later in John's Gospel. This is eternal life, that that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And we don't have to wait. Jesus is to be our daily staple. We can know God and know Jesus right now. We do. If we believe, we've begun to live our eternal life. 
But I wonder if we live like we've got it now. And does it make us look different? The Bible is kind of cryptic about what happens after we die and what happens on that last day. But the Bible is way more specific on how we are to live in relationship with God through Jesus and how we are to live in relationship with each other now. So if the Bible is less specific on what happens in the future, promise, and more specific about what happens in the present reality, then I wonder why we get so caught up in trying to convince people with a threat of hellfire and damnation when the power of deep care lived out in the way that we are loved by God and the way that we love in return should be so powerful and so profound because we look different. I'm not sure that there have been that many people who've come to believe because they've lost an argument about what happens when we die. But countless people have come to believe because they've experienced God in their present. I'm not saying that we should never talk about this future promise. We absolutely should. We should wrestle, we should question, we should explore, and we could share what we believe and know about the future promise. But I am saying that if the present reality of eternal life is already upon us, because we believe and is among us and evident in the community of believers, then that should be our main thing. On Thursday, I got to spend a couple of hours, as I said earlier, with about 20 or or so pastors as we shared together and we ate together. And part of the time together, we had um, someone give a short reflection. Both Rochelle and Marshall from Gold Coast Chapel were there and Marshall gave the reflection. And I was a little taken aback uh, when he started because he used me specifically as the example. And it had nothing to do with my cardigan. (laughs) He said that we'd known each other for 11 years and it's not because we hang out all the time that we have unity. It's because we've taken the time to eat together. And he said that that presses the fast forward button on relationship. I love that expression. Bread is a symbol for much more than a slice to tide us over until dinner. This symbol draws us together to the table, to eat together. In Jesus' time, eating was a community activity, not something that you just did in the car in between meetings. The table where we eat together symbolises a place of conversation and plenty, a place of shared memory and hopes for the future, where God is revealed to God's people and where God's people realise the need for both God and community. Bread is a symbol, as is this table behind me, which in a little while will share a symbolic meal. We're called to gather around the table as a symbol when we gather together in this Anglican church context. But more than that, we're called to gather together and share together and table fellowship and eat together which with other believers because it matters. And it looks like we believe that Jesus is more than just a nice idea. And we, when we do it, it looks like that Jesus is the only thing that sustains and satisfies us. At least that's what it's supposed to look like. As we gather together, we're called to incarnate, which means to bring to life the deep care that Jesus offers us in his flesh. In the same way that the flag lifts an athlete, the table 
with the bread on it should change us. It can press fast forward on relationship. It's an opportunity to ask ourselves as we receive communion or as we gather around a table with other believers to ask, is Jesus necessary for us? Eternal life as a present reality is a life lived out of deep care. Deep care feeds and it nourishes. It quenches every thirst. As Jesus does for us, so we are called to do for one another. Deep care is present. It listens, it loves, it welcomes and it connects. Deep care tells stories about life and helps people find meaning. Deep care offers mercy and forgiveness. Deep care is compassionate. It touches the hurting and broken places of people's lives. Deep care shares a vision for a new life and a different way of being in our world. Deep care gives hope and peace that the world just can't. Deep care reminds us that we are one bread and one body and that we are in unity and our neighbour's life matters as much as our own. Living this type of eternal life now is a witness so powerful that it enables others to experience God without having to win them over with a clever argument or fancy words or threats of hellfire. We are noticeably different when we live a life out of deep care. So Lord, I pray that as you've given us these symbols in our Bible and in our gathering as a church, might they be much more than symbols? Might they be a bridge for something deeper and more profound? Might they cause us to be challenged and changed? To realise that it's more than just an intellectual assent that you are looking for. That to say that we believe in you implies that we are going to look different. That we are going to be a witness in our world by living a life full of deep care. As costly and as challenging as that might be. Lead and guide us as we come to the table. And go with us as we go out carrying deep care with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.